I am delighted to welcome to you to the session for the Dynamic Coalition on Innovative Approaches to Connecting the Unconnected. Uh, my name is Christopher Yu, and along with my co-conveners here, Michael, Kendi, and, and um, Shubi of uh, Cellular Operators of Association of India, and we're actually missing Helani Gilpai of Learn Asia, who's the fourth co-convener, but the IGF gods had the great grace to schedule her at a session in direct conflict with this one, so uh, unfortunately she is with us in spirit, but not in person. Anyway, uh, we are excited about this project. I'm delighted to have you a chance to introduce you to it, to talk about it, but most importantly, to spend as little time talking myself and to tell you the real best part of this is we are trying to explore new ways to connect the unconnected, and what is often missing from the IGF is the people who are actually de deploying the internet in places where it did not exist before and can actually speak about the stories, the challenges they faced, and most importantly, the impact that adding the connectivity has had on people's lives, which is ultimately why we are here and it's ultimately why we care so much about the internet and deploying it. So to give you a brief introduction, I will start with the slides. Um, do I just tell you to advance them? Just, is there a clicker or do I just tell you to advance the slides? Uh, please. Uh, the basic vision of this is that, as everyone knows, we have seven billion people in the world, only half of whom are on the internet. Um, adoption rates are slowing, and the international community set as a goal to connect one and a half billion more people by 2020. From the time of that goal was set until now, we are not on track. We are running behind. At the same time, there are an enormous, and we've discovered hundreds of innovative efforts of new ways to gain the benefits of the internet. But unfortunately, no one is studying these in a systematic way and gathering the information. What does that mean? Everyone is reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And we're missing opportunities to learn and share practices with each other. But second, no one is collecting empirical evidence about what works and what doesn't work. And if what little exists is not done in a consistent way that allows comparisons across projects. So our goal is to try to collect that. And uh, the other question is to look for solutions that will actually get us to scale and really operate in a sustainable way so it's not a project that arises and then falls, that will persist, and also has the chance to be a bridge to how we're going to cover three and a half billion more people. And then lastly, what we're discovering is to mobilize political support. It has to be not just a communications issue. You can't just say we need to connect more people. We have to build bridges to health ministers, education ministers, finance ministers, and eventually prime ministers. And to do that, you have to show how connectivity ties to larger goals such as economic development and healthcare and education. So what is our solution? We are cataloging every initiative we can find globally. Not just the success stories that everyone wants to talk about, but the failure stories to get an accurate sense of how things are going. We have approached all of them to conduct case studies to understand what they are doing, and also to gather empirical data in a consistent way. We are, our plans are to analyze the data and identify models uh, to try to find how to scale this forward. And we are in the process of fielding the first controlled trials about the impact on healthcare, education, and other development goals. Please. So our progress, we've mined a large number of databases, just so you know where the information is coming from. I won't go through all of these. Interestingly, people like WISIS have thanked us because the ITU collects data, but they can't actually analyze it in ways that says one idea is better than the other. They have a difficult political position about picking winners and losers. They are very supportive of our efforts and are very encouraging and allowing them to go forward. Next slide, please. What have we done? We've identified nearly 750 initiatives, all of which are available on a database at oneworldconnected.org. Uh, and if not, we've migrated the server. We'll have to double check whether they're actually up. But if not, I guarantee early in the next year they will all be up. We've contacted all 750-ish uh, for case study interviews. And at this point, then the database spans 153 countries, so it's basically almost the entire UN membership. We've conducted 120 interviews with case studies, 23 of which are posted on the website now. And we hope to have all of them uh, published uh, in the, early in the new year. 
Next slide. Uh, if you want to know the distribution, they are from as, uh, all over the world. As might be expected, uh, the majority are from Asia and Africa. The one side is the total 750 case studies, the other is the interviews. But we also find important case studies in Europe, Latin America, North America, and the like in very interesting ways. Next slide. Um, if you want to know the type of initiatives, we're looking at both supply side and demand side initiatives. That is, how do you connect people? But also, anyone who's in the space knows that the big, there are barriers aside from access and price, lack of digital literacy being the most important, uh, being one important issue. But also, you hear constantly in the developing world, the developed world, the number one reason is that people who don't use the internet don't understand its relevance. They don't know why they need it. And so many of the, you can build great networks, but unless you address this uh, deficit as well, you will not get the goals that we're all pursuing. In terms of technologies, we're seeing Wi-Fi, conventional uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, and, and LTE, 4G LTE, and now 5G fixed technologies, TV white spaces, satellites, and one innovative de deployment using lasers, a laser technology called Li-Fi. Uh, very interesting to study. We'll see how it goes, um, uh, although uh, any new technology obviously is very quite spectacular. We've looked at digital literacy programs, local content programs, localizing content programs and the like, and we continue to gather in case studies and learn more about them. Um, uh, if you look at the different domains, they span everything from community networking, education, capacity building, commercial deployments, e-government, health, gender, agriculture, e-commerce, and the like. And so accessibility, there's some, uh, we have some great uh, disability access studies as well, and we're very excited about them. So we're seeing a very big richness of different things that we're doing. Um, just so you know, these are not our findings. These are self-reported challenges that the projects describe that they face. Uh, more or less an order of frequency, lack of funding, lack of infrastructure, limited capacity and resources, sustainability, uh, resistance from the target of the, the, the audience they're trying to reach, community support, regulations, terrain, all this will be available. You'll see there's a very wide range of challenges that people face, and in fact, what we find is they're all very localized. And so we're trying to draw some themes but are realistic about how that will be implemented. Uh, tentative takeaways, many projects lack revenue altogether. They're served on grants, and they lack a clear path to sustainability. One of the challenges is developing that and evaluating that. Uh, many people uh, measure connectivity without actually looking at the larger goals, which undersells the projects. Many of them uh, really do not involve target communities, which is a major impediment to long-term um, sustainability. And in fact, you hear a lot more discourse than reality, which is why we kind of enjoy having the people here so much who really understand the reality in, in an important way. Next steps, we're going to analyze the data and synthesize it into conceptual and policy frameworks. We're going to look at it for both cost effect and sustainability. We have two lines, standardization and cross-project comparisons are important. At the same time, we're going to develop scenarios because urban areas and rural areas, island societies, mountainous societies, different levels of development all face different challenges. So there's not going to be one magic solution to this. It's going to be a series of scenarios that different policymakers can hopefully apply and understand and qualify what they're doing. And in the last phase, we've gotten a lot of interest from the development banks and the international finance community, in addition to the countries who'll deploy, and also from the impact investing community who want to know, who have uh, private investors who want to know that what they're doing is making a difference. And so we're finding an enormous audience for people who are desperate for hard data of any kind uh, to try to understand this. Uh, we're also doing, and the last uh, most exciting thing in many ways, is to prove the tie to connectivity or to try to analyze it to things such as education, healthcare, and economic development. The gold standard in social science research where you try to attribute causality are called controlled trials. We're in the process of fielding some in healthcare in the U.S., in uh, Vanuatu on education, and we're lucky to have the representatives from Vanuatu here on their important project. And Rwanda is going to span um, economic growth on entrepreneurship, healthcare, and education. We have a pretty remarkable project where they're deploying it for the first time, and we'll be able to uh, analyze this in important ways. How do you get involved? Um, I would say you're involved just by being here. I left off here, we have a website, oneworldconnected.org, where one is the number, not the word, one O-N-E. 
Um, we have a DC mailing list here, and I'd encourage you to join it. We will continue to post information about what we are doing. We have a social media help. We would welcome your feedback on additional case study candidates and other places to look, and we'll bring them into the uh, and share the wonderful things that people are doing with the rest of the world. We have social media presence. We encourage you to follow that as well. And lastly, the most important thing is you can help spread the world about what we're doing. If you're encouraged about what we're attempting to do, uh, we're only part of the way through it. We need the support of everybody to make this as, as strong as we possibly can. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Kendi, who is one of the co-conveners of our, of, our, uh, of our Dynamic Coalition. Thank you, Christopher, and, and again, congratulations on this remarkable initiative. Um, I think my role here really is to, to speak as quickly as possible and let us hear from these remarkable case studies that Christopher and his team have convened. So I just want to say two quick things. I mean, first of all, um, you know, in, in, in a few stages, we've had many years of developing best practices for, in regulation to promote uh, investment competition in first fixed and then mobile connectivity. Um, so we know a lot about how to promote competition and, and entry and, and reach of networks. Um, then commercial networks have deployed in some ways much further than we would have expected and as Christopher said, much further than people have even adopted. Um, and they benefit from enormous scale, having now basically one standard, um, cheap equipment, amazing devices. Um, so that is all really good, but it's not going everywhere. There, clearly there's just areas where there's no commercial benefit. Um, to deploying a network where um, governments may not have the resources or may not choose to use them to deploy. So that's where this initiative comes in to compress the time needed to find the best practices, to figure out the best, um, you know, the best of um, connectivity type to use, the best approach, what can be s sustainable, what can be scalable. So I think that's where this initiative is really valuable. And then just secondly, as, as a bit of an aside, I think we, we hear a lot here at the IGF, this may be your first one, this may be your 12th one, but we hear a lot about the fact that no decisions are taken at an IGF. And without wading into that debate, some people think that's good, some people think it's bad. But this kind of use of the IGF to bring together all of these different people for information gathering and for information sharing, I think is just an unambiguous benefit of having an IGF. And, with that, I'll, I'll step aside for Subi, and then we can hear from these case, case studies and learn from them. Thank you. Subi Chaturvedi. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, I do echo Michael's sentiments in congratulating uh, Professor Yu and Sharda for the excellent work that they've been putting in building this together. I come from India. I head public affairs for the Cellular Operators Association. When it comes to India and China, numbers come easy. And um, so we have over a billion people who have mobile connectivity, which is great in terms of telephony, voice. But when it comes to access to the internet and data, it is unique as a paradox. We have just 28% of people who are still online, which is great because it's second only to China. Uh, we beat the US this year. Now, um, the, the incredible uh, paradox is we also have some of the largest numbers in the world who need to be brought online. So while the government has taken a lot of initiatives, um, at the IGF, having been a former MAG member, one of the questions that we grappled with uh, about five years ago is to how we can make the IGF more relevant, we can create more intersessional work where from going from one meeting to the other meeting and beyond workshops, what is the value that we can create? One of the key uh, foundation stones, the VISIS agenda talked about a knowledge agenda. It talked about in uh, the narratives translating into best practices, things that you could take away from the main IGF international and regional initiatives. And I agree when Michael talks about the debate where we don't do binding recommendations and which is the beauty of being at the IGF. You debate policy questions questions, you get to work with stakeholder groups, and that is what One World Connect really has shaped into. For us, um, access doesn't mean 
the fixing air conditioning in a perfect house. It means getting online. It means experiencing your first ever experience also with literacy. So when it comes to India, just, just showing some numbers across, we have over 900 million people who are connected, but just 200 million smartphones and over 200 million people who are first time keypad literates. So their first experience with literacy really is with the mobile. When it comes to these projects, uh, one of the key barriers when we started looking at the work that Professor Yu has been doing, it is fantastic because it's not just episodic. This is probably the first study of its kind, which is talking about empirical evidence. One of the questions, Professor Yu, that we've also been grappling with is what is the test of a good regulation? A lot of um, uh, the countries currently, especially developing countries and emerging economies, are going through a lot of flux. They're going through a lot of change. And we've been looking at how innovative practices practices can be part of policy and regulatory frameworks. So while identifying barriers to access, what one really learned was it was in addition to renewable power because people couldn't charge their mobile phones if they had no access to power. One of the biggest concerns was the availability of local language content and also the fact that the cost of access, the affordability of devices. So while in some cases you've seen the rates come down, these innovative models and I'm looking forward to hearing more from the people on the panel today because they have some amazing stories to tell as to how just access to connectivity has been shaping and changing and saving lives. So whether it's e-medicine, telemedicine, whether it's e-education, these are great examples which when they become successful, they've actually seen a positive response from their governments. So. Um, I, I, as far as India is concerned, we've seen one of the largest unique identification projects, which is bringing people online, which is also looking at investing in digital India. What is great, and I'll rest here, is the initiative that the government's recently taken, which is investing over 400 million US dollars in um, digital literacy and has promised by the next financial year, we would look at 600 million new digital literates. So, so projects such as these where you can learn from, where you can also reach out to your government with success stories of scalability and cooperation are very welcome. And thank you for this enriching experience. I'm really looking forward to hearing more and learning from you. Thank you. Well, I should be thanking both both Shubi and Michael, without whom this Destin Dynamic Coalition wouldn't be possible. So we're deeply grateful for their support. Um, and without further ado, the most important part of this is, I think, is for you to hear from the people who are doing it in the world and actually making it possible. I'd like to start with on my left with Claudia Selly of AT&T, who's going to talk about a wonderful program they're doing called Escuela Plus. Um, thank you very much, Professor Yu, first of all, for having me here and giving the opportunity of uh, presenting and talking about this um, program. Uh, but most importantly, uh, congratulations on this in initiative, which is really uh, amazing and it's really useful. Um, so um, now to the program. Uh, Escuela, Escuela Plus is uh, arguably the most advanced uh, and the most complete TV education uh, program that exists uh, worldwide. And, um, and it's really cl trying to close the, the digital uh, divide and the education gap. It's reaching uh, more than 8,600 schools, uh, 2 million students, uh, 15K teachers that are uh, trained in eight different uh, locations of Latin America. So it goes from uh, Ecuador to Argentina to Mexico and, uh, and, other, and other places. Um, of course, uh, uh, well, we, with DirecTV um, Cinema, we uh, grant um, 2,000, around 2,000 US dollar uh, to film students uh, and we have already uh, received more than 1,300 short films uh, from uh, eight different uh, universities and of course when you um, touch upon education you need to have long-term vision and we started off uh, with 20 schools and now we're reaching more than 8,600 schools. How do we do that? First of all we combine technology so uh, satellite uh, TV uh, together with content. In fact, we partner uh, with different um, with different organizations. We have uh, Disney, Discovery Channel, uh, we have National Geographic, and so far and so forth, and also the ministry uh, content. And uh, they try to teach teachers, try to teach in a different way uh, as well. In fact, it is a high-tech program, but also high-touch in the sense that we try to reflect the, the local realities and, and teach them, interest them in different ways. 
different ways. One of example that has really um, amazed me in, a, in an innovative way is that, for example, they try to teach um, science and math uh, through sport. So by looking at the game, for example, they can analyze the movement of the player and uh, they, they can explain the Newton law, for example. It's just uh, a different way to attract attention of young people that are really living in very remote areas. In fact, we try really to go into areas which are remote, first of all, and which have a lot of problems, such as, for example, um, war zones. So, um, and we try also to integrate and to help the reintegration of uh, people who are in jail, and so to give them also a second opportunity. Uh, these projects have, for example, happened in uh, Argentina as well as in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, the other um, thing is that, uh, very interesting, is that it has also a very strong um, corporate social responsibility component. And in fact, there are different um, aspects of it. Uh, first of all, uh, there is, for example, the project Piedra, um, Papel and Tijera, where um, employees devote their, uh, volunt their, their hour, the volunteer, to um, help reconstruct or help uh, you know, improve school, orphanage, um, and, and other facilities. Then DirecTV also offers um, the uh, TV Air platform to NGOs, so we have more than 50 NGOs that can use this platform for free. Um, and then uh, also they're trying to reduce their um, carbon emissions, so they're counting to reduce um, it by 29% uh, through the use of uh, set top of boxes. So you can really see that, um, you, you know, we really try um, to have always innovative uh, way of uh, looking at education. And uh, I think the most important thing is that we educate the key people here we are, that are the uh, teachers. So teachers have traveled around 70 thousand kilometers um, to reach the different location and the rural areas and to really bring uh, their knowledge and uh, to develop skills in these uh, young people and uh, I would stop here thank you very much it's uh, and it reinforces some of the findings we have we're having in these initiatives the importance of emphasizing the demand side with local language content locally relevant content engaging local communities and it's uh, uh, Latin American, it's pan-Latin American, and it's a spectacular program. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit around the dais because what you will see is we have five different continents represented, and it's going to be both people who are doing supply side, network creation, and demand side. And in fact, we're going to try to give you a, a richness of the sense of the, of the breadth of the type of interventions people are making. And Vasilis, if you'll let me call on you next, uh, the tremendous work you're doing in Sarantoporo in uh, helping uh, connect Greece. Thank you. Press the button. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank uh, One World Connected first for, uh, for inviting me here, giving me the opportunity to present what we do. And let me be more some, somehow like, um, uh, let me uh, tell you a few stories from our network. Um, so uh, an old woman in, in the village is examined by the visiting doctor. The doctor wants to prescribe her the medicine but he cannot, he cannot access the online platform. An elder couple in the village is longing for their children and grandchildren to visit them. Their children always seem to be reluctant to do so. A farmer sells his crop to a city's supermarket. He's not content, but he has no other choice. A young student cannot participate in the online courses her teacher delivers, unlike her fellow students in the city. A group of immigrant workers in animal hus husbandry are looking depressed. They hardly, com they hardly communicate with their families back home. What do the, all these stories have in common? They take place in Sarantaporo, an isolated Greek village in central Greece next to Olympus Mountain. Fast forward seven years. Today, the sarantaporo.gr community network is established as a common telecommunication infrastructure, providing open internet access connectivity to all. Place the router in the doctor's house, the old woman instructs us. This way, he will be able to prescribe our medicines. I used to see my grandchildren every two years when they came visiting from the States. Now, we can drink our coffee together using Skype explains another old woman from the village. 
my daughter built a website for me. This is how the organizers of the No Intermediaries market discovered me. I sold all the year's crop there at a much better price for me and the consumers. Never again supermarkets. This is the story of the farmer whose 80-year-old father also opened a Facebook account to make new friends. A student manages to excel at the university admission exams, winning the first place after she followed her teacher's online support courses. And those immigrant workers today have happier faces, being able to communicate with their families on a daily basis. Our community network is changing local people's lives, and we have many more stories to prove it. Today we're serving 14 villages, almost 3,500 inhabitants, in the region of Sarantaporo village, central Greece. We are working closely with locals, providing training and support, building awareness, and sharing knowledge and experiences. Not everything is ideal, though. We have many free riders who discourage the more engaged people. Many young children cannot tell the difference between internet and Facebook. Some locals believe that we do what we do because we want to run for mayor. These and a, lot, uh, and a lot more are challenges we try to tackle, learning from our mistakes and from experiences of other community networks. Thank you. You have a word. Yeah, we, if you do the, for the great things you do, you deserve possibly to be there. <laughs> so. OK, you have your vote. So this is inspiring. And thank you for bringing these personal stories. Now you're starting to understand why we are so excited about this project. And it's one of the dimensions that we're starting to bring. So thank you for coming to share that. Uh, next, Josephine, may I ask you from the Tunapanda Institute in Kenya to talk about the great work you are doing? Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Josephine Miliza and I come from Nairobi, Kenya. We run an NGO called Tunapanda Institute, and what we do is train young people in technology design and business. So we receive uh, the young people are aged between 19 and 25 years, and they are taken through a three-month training program, which is free, and at the same time, we give them a stipend to be able to facilitate uh, their transportation. This is because uh, the young people that you're dealing with are from an informal settlement in Kenya, uh, which is the largest in Kenya. And so most of the families there earn less than a dollar a day. And the challenge is that also access to higher education is very expensive, which means that most of them, after finishing their secondary uh, school training, uh, they don't have any other opportunities that they can be able to pursue. So through our training program, after the three months, uh, we try to get them employment so that they can uh, increase their earning potential. Right now, we are at 70% uh, employment rate, and we have seen that uh, for most of them who go through their, uh, the program, is that, for example, one of our students uh, was working after high school. He started uh, washing cars around, and he was earning 400 Kenyan shillings, which is like four dollars a month but right now he's earning uh four hundred dollars uh, a month working as a customer service at a local at a local company which deals with solar so all these success stories are what's motivated us now to start the community network and we receive over 300 applications but we can only be able to take 25 at a time so because of this, we figured out that why uh, don't we decentralize the learning? So we built an e-learning platform uh, that has offline and online capabilities. And then uh, we selected five of our partners, which are mostly school, to host the equipment uh, for the wireless connectivity. So we built a mesh network that connects back to our school. Uh, our expectation was that uh, since we are receiving so many applications, then many of the young people will rush and take the courses that were on the platform. But we were disappointed because after like two months, very, very few were taking up the courses. So we decided to find out why. And one of the things uh, that came out is that they don't just want to get access to offline content, but they want also to be able to go online, which was our network was not offering. And also the aspect of human interaction in learning, uh, 
in Kenya, it is not, uh, not so many people are well accustomed to learning online or using MOOCs. So they prefer the interaction where they're able to go to a class and learn together with their peers. Also skills on using the internet uh, of uh, digital literacy skills uh, was also challenging. And what should they do once they are done with the courses? Some of our courses we are offering online were technical, so that means that someone needs a laptop. So when you have an, a smartphone, there's not much you can do in terms of learning how graphic design. So this uh, uh, made us to now rethink our model, and so instead of just using our partners as hosts for our equipment, we are now using them as hosts for learning centers. And so we are partnering now with schools and facilities that have either computers that young people can be able to come and access. And through that, we are offering digital literacy training both to teachers and the students. And also our plan now is to find a way to roll out internet access that is affordable to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. It's an inspiring work that you're doing. I only hope that you can continue to grow. Uh, Shabani from Grand Marg in India is doing an innovative way to connect more people to the internet uh, through TV white spaces. Uh, thank you, Professor, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak here. Um, I represent uh, Grand Marg. Uh, it's a community network initiative uh, by the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, we, connect, uh, we connect villages that are completely unconnected. So uh, we began with our project in the year 2012, uh, wherein we started with the first TV white space test bed. And we connected uh, seven villages uh, through the TV white space technology. Uh, we, we had important learnings from this, uh, uh, from this, from the, uh, from after, the after we deployed the test bed. Uh, one of it was that uh, the t private telecom operators were not uh, ready to take uh, the villagers as their customers. Uh, they did not, they denied taking them as their customers because of the acquisition cost uh, and the cost of acquiring each customer. Uh, that's when the people in the villages, they decided, they told us that, uh, can we form a community network of our own? Uh, and can you do us, can you give us the handholding for that? Uh, that inspired us and uh, we went on to scale the seven villages to 25 villages, uh, covering, uh, uh, covering an area of 350 square kilometers. And these villages even did not have any voice connectivity. So these are villages that are situated very far away. Um, uh, not so far away from Mumbai, uh, which is a metropolitan city, and uh, the, 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 there, was, there was no connectivity, no 2G, 3G signals over there, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, people had to travel long distances uh, to, the, to the nearby city to complete their, uh, serve, the, the things that they need to do on the internet, that is, uh, uh, there's a social security thing the, for marriage certificates, birth certificates, death certificates, and things of that sort. These areas were also under the, under, um, uh, they, they had very high infant and child mortality and maternal mortality rates are very high over there. One of the highest in the region, in, the, in uh, Maharashtra, where Mumbai is located. So we, uh, we took connectivity over there uh, with an optimal mix of technology. Uh, we did it. Uh, we uh, did the. Uh, we uh, did it through the TV white spaces and the 5.8 gigahertz in the unlicensed band. Uh, we await for the TV white space license from the regulators. We still haven't got it, but we have connected these villages uh, with the 5.8 gigahertz in the unlicensed band. Uh, there are. Uh, we have set up six base stations, and we have taken a lump sum bandwidth of 116 Mbps from a local telecom operator, Tata Tele Services, and we have set up 60. Five Wi-Fi hotspots in these locations. We serve approximately uh, a population of 25,000 people. That is a roughly 1,000 per, 1, per village. So it's 25 villages. Um, we have not only done the uh, done setting up uh, covering the villages, but we have also looked into how to make technology very cheap and affordable for the villagers, easy to deploy by the villagers themselves. And also we have also looked into uh, how 
to make the, um, the, the network a sustainable network over there. And that's one of the main contributions of ours and the villagers are very happy about it because uh, they wanted, uh, they have set up the network by themselves now and they are actually running it by themselves. So we are, we are happy that when our funding gets over, um, uh, we, they, we will not be sad that we have to request a telecom operator to take them as their, uh, uh, their uh, customers. They, this network is going to perpetuate year after year. And with a very minimum cost they are doing, it's just $2 per month that they are, uh, they are uh, using bandwidth. We have uh, the recent figures of bandwidth in just one cluster of village is uh, 63. It has, uh, it has, it has, is 63, 63 users that are there in the month of November. And they are using 350 uh, Gbps of bandwidth. So it's like, it's, it's, it's good for the villages. We have also, we have also gotten some of the programmatic interventions uh, like e-governance services that uh, the government was not able, that, that there is content in local language already available, but the government was not finding a way to uh, reach to the villages. So e-governance services are also uh, reaching the villages now. There is e-learning in the schools where uh, teachers are using internet to teach the uh, children over there and e-health services because this, as I told you, that this region is under the, uh, uh, it's reeling under the problem of high maternal, infant and child mortality uh, rates. We are also looking into uh, to make this uh, this uh, network completely uh, self-sufficient by itself. We are looking into developing uh, a network remote network monitoring system, uh, which is being developed uh, at IIT Bombay by our team. And we are actually showing the villagers how to manage the entire network by themselves. We are also doing a lot of research on cost effectiveness of technologies because it need not be just one technology per se, like the TV white space, it can be 5.8 gigahertz in unlicensed band, it can be satellite, it can be fiber, but which is a cost effective technology and which, by which technology, if they use it, it's the minimum cost that they will incur and return on investment at the earliest that they can get. Uh, this is um, this is something, and we are also looking into the impact uh, that this uh, this connectivity has brought about in the lives of the people. This is com this is just uh, happening in, on the field now. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Shabani. It actually brings up two very important parts of sustainability. One, the fact that you have a revenue model that can, that can continue to exist and that becomes important, but also training people to giving it the capability to stay up. Many, we find many projects go up, but then they don't stay up. Unless you have trained a force to do it, or in this case, remote monitoring, using the, the power yes. of digital technologies yes. to your service is actually a brilliant idea. And so thank you for being such a pathbreaker. And our last speaker is Diana Wu from Comcast talking about a wonderful digital literacy program in the US called Comcast Internet Essentials. Thank you, Professor Yu, for all the great work you've done with One World Connected and um, for this important conversation here today. Um, so I think what unites everyone in here in this room is the understanding that technology empowers people, you know, in the 21st century digital economy. Um, it, it's important, it's crucial to uh, job growth and social equality, it facilitates uh, education, uh, job training, and entrepreneurship. Um, and so uh, I'm here today, today to talk about um, Internet Essentials, which is a program that Comcast NBC Universal launched in uh, 2011, so about six years ago. Um, and uh, today it's one of the, uh, it's actually the largest um, adoption program in the U.S. Uh, we've connected about four million people so far, and, um, and it's growing, it continues to grow. Um, but so before I get into the program, let me briefly speak to the state of broadband in the U.S. Um, of course, you know, the road to um, universal access and adoption in every country is different. Um, in the U.S., we have almost 96% of Americans have access to fixed broadband, but only 82% choose to adopt. Um, so that means that although 4% of the uh, population lacks access to broadband, 18% chooses to not subscribe. So that suggests that the main challenge in the U.S. is uh, on the adoption side. 
Um, and among the non-adopters, uh, there is a digital divide by age and ethnicity, but the biggest um, variable is education. 94% of those with a college degree uh, adopt, but only 64% uh, of those with a high school diploma uh, choose to, to subscribe to broadband. So the research shows the main barriers are lack of affordable broadband and uh, computer equipment. Um, and the biggest bar barrier is digital li literacy. So a study by Dr. John Horgan, who was the research director for the FCC's National Broadband Plan, uh, found that uh, a perceived lack of relevance is, is the key barrier to, uh, to non-adopters. And there was also a survey by the Department of Commerce finding that uh, almost two-thirds of non-adopting households would not subscribe to broadband even if it's free. Um, so we set out to tackle this divide by taking a, a holistic approach um, that we think you know, gets at the drivers, the, the various drivers of non-adoption. So we offer service at $9.95 a month, um, subsidized computer equipment uh, at $150, and most importantly, free digital literacy and relevance training um, online, in person, and um, in print. Um, and so with this um, holistic approach, um, you know, we've had great success and, um, you know, as I said today, it's the most successful uh, program in the U.S. And 98% uh, of users say their children uh, use it for, for their homework, 93% uh, say it's had a positive effect on their children's education, and 62% of users say they've, they've um, used it for job training and, and to, job, to, to find a job. Um, so the program has really grown in the last six years. When we first started, we targeted families with um, uh, school-aged children because we wanted to address the homework gap um, and make sure that uh, children from low-income households don't get left behind. But today we are um, uh, we have pilots um, and we've expanded in different cities and, and we have pilots for seniors, uh, community college students, and um, uh, residents of public housing. Um, so to uh, close, I think, you know, as Professor Yu said, there's not a, a universal formula, um, but in our experience, the, the, there are two takeaways. One is the importance of literacy and relevance training. People need to have a, a concrete understanding of how going online will help uh, their daily lives. And so we've spent about $350 million in uh, cash and in-kind contributions uh, to, to support this type of training. Um, and the second takeaway is um, echoing what Claudia said earlier, uh, which is that local partnerships are absolutely crucial in getting uh, the word out about the program, but also um, in building trust with the communities that we're, that we're trying to help. So we've partnered with over 9,000 different organizations. Um, so these are uh, schools, libraries, churches, um, local leaders, civic leaders, and um, you know, various people in the community. Well, thank you for sharing with us the story. One of the wonderful things I love about Comcast Internet Essentials is because they're so longstanding and their commitment to collecting data, they actually have the best longitudinal data. They actually follow the users across time, which is a great luxury from a, a social science standpoint to understand what works. And the fact that they are using different types, we talk about digital literacy training as if everyone knows what that means. They do in-person training, print training, and online training. And the longitudinal data is helping us to analyze which of, those th which of those things are the most effective. And to make claims about when is it worth undertaking the expense of doing in-person training, because obviously other forms are much cheaper. And we need information about how to develop those programs and the emphasis you might want to put on it as well. So it's just, I think it's a fantastic program, and it's an example of how we're all learning from the different contexts, understanding for every different country, you'll have to contextualize it for your own unique situation. Um, at this point, I would like to pause uh, and see if there are any questions from the audience and to see that we have an inspirational set of speakers here. But actually, before I do that, since you're here and since we seem to have time, um, I, uh, we actually, Ezekiel uh, Tari, who came, who de deployed a community network called, um, in Vanuatu, an island republic in, uh, an island government in the Pacific, has a, uh, an initiative called Mayo Telecommunications Committee. And uh, since um, he, he actually spoke in an earlier panel, but since he's here, if you could just share a few words about your experience building your network in Vanuatu. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, thank everyone for this uh, opportunity to uh, share with you some uh, successful story about the internet connectivity in uh, 
my country. My name is uh, Isigel uh, Tari from Vanuatu. Um, we have been uh, engaged to one of the project to connect to our islands in Vanuatu, the small island in the northern part of the country called Maiwo, where I came from. Um, it is uh, an island where it has a population of about 6,000 plus with uh, vulnerable people, uh, disabilities, uh, where we can, uh, I can uh, say that they are, uh, they are vulnerable in, uh, in any means of uh, uh, way of uh, thinking in our uh, way of uh, welfare. So we have been running the project for an year now. Uh, our successful story is about the health, where um, the My World Telecommunication Committee, where I am the chairman, uh, the people in my island, in the eastern part of My uh, they have been uh, stay without the communication uh, access accessibility for uh, many years. And they have been struggling uh, for years. Uh, when a sick patient came to the health center, uh, they have to carry, carry the sick patient uh, up the hill, very steep hill, down the valley. When time is uh, no good, like uh, bad weather, there's plenty of mud, running creeks, thick, uh, soft mud, but they have to carry the sick patient to the other side. It's uh, very difficult to imagine, but uh, in our country also we have uh, like a lack of resources uh, in the health uh, department. There is no proper data system in place. When a sick patient uh, is uh, lying in the health center, uh, information cannot pass. So by putting up the, pro the project, uh, it saves lives, saves a lot of lives. Thank you very, very much for the partners. Uh, one will uh, connected uh, the commitment to the people in my island, in my country, save their lives. Um, we have been... Uh, bearing life people when there's no proper uh, connectivity for information. The next year, uh, when someone is sick and badly um, has a health problem, with the project now, when he admit to the health center, when the nurse admit him in the health center, they have a proper uh, facility in place where the telemedicine is now operating um, from January 28th last year, 2016 to uh, 27 this year, May. Um, there are about 31 lives that were saved through this telemedicine. Um, as we are approaching the end of this year, uh, it's about 70 people in total of the 31 people from uh, last year, July 28 to June this year. You add up to this year, end of year, it's about 70 people that were saved by this project, the telemedicine. And uh, the second phase, we are looking at the e-education to uh, put up, we have already put up a repeater station to take the uh, internet from the source to the school. Uh, but uh, it's like we have challenges with uh, the security to uh, maintain the system. When we have bad weather, uh, you know, tropical countries, we have six months good time, 
six month bad time, bad weather. So we have uh, the challenges there. When where the lightning strikes and it uh, uh, it, it damage damage the repeater station. So the e uh, education is still uh, in challenges, but uh, for the telemedicine, it's still going, and uh, we are looking forward to do better with uh, our partners and in the in the in the community level. We have. Uh, uh, committed ourselves to mobilize, organize. We made fundraisings locally to raise money for local support to help partners to continue to strive on, to build up the project for our people. I think that's all I can uh, say in this uh, important forum. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Ezekiel, for sharing the story. On Monday, he shared a picture that demonstrated eloquently the problems his island faces. From the east side of the island to get to, when you need to go to a hospital, it's a two-day journey that requires you to be carried by stretcher over the mountains to a place where you can access the public transportation. And the ability to use telemedicine in these remote health centers to, di to diagnose when you need to undertake that journey has literally saved 70 lives in the, of, six, of a population of 6,000 in about a year. It's simply stunning. Claudia? Okay. Um, at this point, we go to the question part of the program. Uh, please uh, uh, identify yourself so we know who you are, but uh, please, uh, we'd love to, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Winston Roberts. I'm from New Zealand, representing uh, an NGO called IFLA, which is the International Federation of Library Associations, and also representing Internet New Zealand, which is our local ISOC. Um, I just have a question to the gentleman from Vanuatu, uh, and unfortunately the captioning didn't pick up the name of his country, Vanuatu, so I'm saying it now for the captioning because it doesn't seem fit for purpose. Okay, uh, my question is, you referred to your island. Were you... Uh, were your comments um, referring to a particular island where you come from personally, or were they generally applying to all of the islands of Vanuatu? And secondly, um, do they relate to the situation after the cyclone? Because, um, you know, the cyclone that devastated Vanuatu about three years ago, I think it was, three or four years ago. Has that, um, is the situation now one of reconstruction? And if it's reconstruction, um, can you uh, say if these developments that you're referring to are new, if they survive the cyclone? Um, were there things before that were destroyed which are now economically difficult to rebuild? Can you give us a general picture of the, of the rebuilding process? Thank you, <laughs> sorry, that's a complicated question. Thank you. Um, first, I'd have a question of, my name is Dorothy Gordon, and I work in tech for development. Um, the first question I'd have is one of clarification, because the speakers spoke about people getting online, but they made no distinction between how many women, how many men, and I'm very curious about whether there's any differential. Um, I'm really happy that um, the panelists from India talking about white space. I'm really happy you talked about the cost of deployment because I think that is one of the valuable things that this network could come out with, looking at the relative cost of deployment of the different technologies in the different contexts. Because as Professor Yu said, there are too many of these initiatives that collapse as soon as the funding disappears. But what I'm really concerned with is um, I'm supposed to be the UNESCO IFAP um, chair for the working group on information literacy. And information literacy is so fluid in its definition, sometimes it's just digital literacy. But we talk a lot about preparing people to make use of these technologies. I'd really like to hear from people what they think about how we can incorporate 
training on preparing them for the cultural impacts of those technologies. One of the things that was not mentioned also was the kind of speed of bandwidth. I'm working with somebody who is introducing high-speed bandwidth to some of the um, islands in the Pacific. Right now, the connections are very slow. You cannot game uh, for most islands. You cannot game, you cannot access um, reality TV. You know, there's so many things that people do on the internet that you can't do when your connection is not stable and it's slow. What happens when you have operators introducing high-speed bandwidth into community, a community of 6,000 people with a very vulnerable cultural heritage? I'd really like you to comment on that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mike Jensen here from the Association for Progressive Communications. Thanks, Professor Yu, for bringing an interesting panel together. I had a, an observation which um, leads to a question for you, or a couple, and then a couple for the other panelists. Um, you, you kind of introduced uh, your initiative, uh, implying that the, the main focus is on this issue of connecting the people that are not connected. Now, uh, to my mind, actually, the majority of people that are connected, I actually call them barely connected, because the majority of them are on slow and uh, unaffordable metered broadband connections which, for which they cannot really exploit the tool uh, affordably. So I'm wondering to what extent your uh, gathering of initiatives, analysis of them, includes the policy and regulatory environment which we really need to change in many countries to push down the, the high cost of, of access. And in fact, many of those policy and in regulatory environment uh, initiatives to have that changed can also uh, radically increase the potential for covering areas that are not covered as well. So I'm just wondering to what extent uh, you're able to uh, include that in, in your uh, area of analysis. And then the second point for you is to do with um, the extent to which you're able to follow up. Because, you know, a lot of these initiatives are aspirational. Uh, many of them have really started recently, or even if they've started a long time ago, they take a long time to get going. You know how long development takes, especially in rural areas. So I'm wondering who your funders are and to what extent they have an appetite to keep financing you to, to actually go and look at these activities a year or two down the road. Uh, then for Vasily, my question was, we heard some interesting example of the, the use of, of actually information created in the community in terms of the, uh, the uh, promotion of, of uh, the agricultural marketing uh, produce. Uh, I was wondering if you had any ideas or views or other kinds of local information production that could be add real value to these projects. Uh, I'm not only thinking of, of say, local websites on the history of the, of the region or whatever that may be of value for tourists, but what about things like sensor networks where you can actually generate uh, useful uh, environmental information, for example, and other types of information that could be of value more broadly, and that information is very hard to get in these remote and rural areas. And then finally, my question for Sunni is um, I'd like to understand the, the position of your uh, regulate, your um, cellular association because as far as, as far as I can see, and this is quite the case that I've seen in other parts of the world too, generally the cellular mobile operators are opposed to any of these uh, innovative uses of spectrum um, and spectrum sharing such as TV white space and, and uh, Wi-Fi, uh, e even in areas where there is no service from you and so I'm just wondering you know in fact it seems to be you're shooting yourselves in the foot in a way because you know if there's people are online from some other type of connectivity they're still going to be calling your network so you will be generating the revenue thank you at this point um, with apologies to the people who raised their hands we're running out of time and so I will ask our panelists to respond briefly <laughs> and to make sure that we don't run over and uh, offer any thoughts that they may have to the questions that have been asked Claudia um, 
Sure. I, I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, um, there was a point raised uh, on uh, policy and regulatory environment, which I think is a great point in the sense that, of course, uh, this plays uh, a strong role as well in helping uh, reaching uh, the unconnected and the rural areas. So, of course, we try to work with the local government in making them understand what are the needs and how technology advances fast in terms of also of uh, not having a too prescriptive regulation which might hinder the innovation and which might uh, impede as well as reaching uh, some areas. We do work in uh, public private partnership, of course, so, and um, also with, with the local uh, government. And there was a point on cultural um, impact, of course, uh, it's true, of, uh, technology will, uh, has a strong impact uh, on the, um, you know, on the local realities. What we try to do, um, of course, is to uh, reflect uh, through the content also the local realities and so to take that into account and to work with the teacher um, and, and, and the pupils together um, to address the different problems may, they may have. Diana. Since we're a domestic company, I'll uh, let the others speak. Shabani. Uh, thanks for that comment uh, from you. Um, yeah, so the number of men and women who are online, uh, the data is uh, still being collected. We, st we don't have the data yet. Uh, but um, we, are, we are providing uh, bandwidth, two Mbps bandwidth at each location in the village. And we have made it mandatory at five points in the village. So three points are mandatory points, wherein one is the local self-government office, the other is the school, and the third is the primary healthcare center. These are the three mandatory points at each village. And apart from it, uh, the two other points are, one is a community center, which is uh, where the youth uh, come together in the evenings uh, after, the, after their work, they come there. And it, the other one is a strategic location inside the village. So it is, uh, it is, it is just these five points where we are giving, um, are providing the bandwidth. Uh, so Wi-Fi access points are there over there. Uh, regarding the question of cultural impact uh, that uh, that this uh, has got about, uh, we have still not done the analysis. But uh, yeah, but some of the times I often see that um, uh, women in the villages they want to take it up on themselves, like in the sense that uh, women who are deprived of uh, some of the information, like uh, for example something related to their physical uh, appearance or their bodily changes. Uh, or some symptomatic changes, uh, so they they take uh, they take this into account and they look into the internet. Thanks. So quickly, Ezekiel, the six thousand people. Uh, thank you, General Man, for the question. Uh, six thousand people is from my island, my uh, The country's uh, population is about two thousand two hundred thousand plus. Uh, concerning the natural hazards, the disaster. Uh, the category Cyclone 5 PAM, which has been struck our country, uh, that was, um, uh, yeah, damaged uh, some of the facilities there. But uh, you know, tropical countries like Vanuatu is included in, we have always tropical depression, tropical stress, tropical hazards. So uh, it's all about uh, natural disaster. Yeah, we need repair. Thank you. Josephine. I'll take the question on gender. So uh, on our side, uh, there are two aspects to it. So the first thing is that during the, uh, for the training program, one thing we noted is that we receive very few applications from women. From women. So like uh, less than 30% come from women. And this is a free training program, but because uh, we say it's a tech cost, then they don't apply. So one thing that we do, we've partnered with uh, local schools and we do uh, sort of like encouragement sessions where we go and train them about the opportunities that there are in tech and we see a lot of interest uh, from them and for the women uh, we work with our local organizations also that focus on women the challenge with women is also that once we train them they say that they do not have access to the devices so for example you need a smartphone to access the internet and since they are the breadwinners they say I cannot uh, forego food for my family or school fees for my children just to get a smartphone. Yes. Um, 
Okay, I will reply on the question concerning uh, whether we are uh, adding value on our network by uh, uh, using um, uh, other technologies. So. We are planning to use some smart farming technologies like planting sensors for uh, soil uh, humidity so that we can re return to the farmers information about how and when to irrigate their, uh, their plots. This is something that uh, adds real value to our infrastructure and it's something that cannot be done uh, just by having internet. You need to have infrastructure in place. So, uh, at this point, we are slightly over, so I will call this. I thank everyone for being here. I hope you understand why we are so excited about this project. There was a question for Subi. She will talk to you afterwards, if that's okay. Um, thank you all for coming, and particularly thank you for the people for the people who are doing the real work on the ground for sharing their stories. I will say this: um, two little things. We actually have scarves which we are giving away, and we are welcome to take them with you because we do not want to take them home. So, this, so we are happy to have them. Uh, we also have postcards which were lost for th the first three days of the IGF that detail some of the slides, the sites we're doing. And then thank, the last thing I would like to do is to thank the the two, uh, the two students who are staff people who are working this so hard, Muge Hiseki, who's sitting in the back, and Sharda Srinivasan, who's working, walking with the scarves uh, right now, the, because they've been instrumental in pushing this project forward. And thank you to all of you for being here, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day at the IGF.